welcome everybody to our September Pearls of Wit and Wisdom. Again, I'm Ross Eastman. I work with Dave on the uh, special community lecture series, of which the Pearls of Wit and Wisdom is one. And I'd also like to uh, uh, extend a special welcome to those that are viewing this presentation for the first time through the Pikes Peak Library District. The Pearls of Wit and Wisdom, along with a variety of other classes and courses, are sponsored by the Pillar Institute, and we are a volunteer-run, nonprofit organization with focus on lifelong learning opportunities for all ages. Uh, if you'd like to have more information on Pillar, go to our website at visitpillar.org, where you can get membership information, uh, download the course catalog, and so forth. Again, we welcome you to join us as a member. So with that said, let's begin today's community lecture. Our pearl today is Margaret Sabin. Margaret joined Penrose St. Francis Health Services as the President and Chief Executive Officer in November of 2008. In this capacity, she oversees the daily operations of the 522-bed hospital system, which includes Penrose Hospital, the 126-year-old St. Francis Medical Center, which is Colorado Springs' first hospital, the Penrose Mountain Urgent Care, Penrose Community Urgent Care, and the Penrose St. Francis Health Learning Center. In July of 2009, Margaret was named the South State Hospital Group President for Centura Health, overseeing operations at all three Centura hospitals in Southern Colorado. This includes the Penrose St. Francis in Colorado Springs, the St. Mary Corwin Medical Center in Pueblo, and the St. Thomas More Hospital in Canyon City. Additionally, she serves as chair of Centura Health's Trauma Council, where she leads the first integrated healthcare network, creating a trauma system that links, Pen that links Penrose St. Francis Health Services with 20 other facilities and a variety of essential services. Margaret was named a Colorado Springs Business Journal's Woman of Influence in 2009. And it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce our September Pearl, Ms. Margaret Sabin. Thank you. It, it, uh, it's an honor to be here. What a, first of all, what a lovely setting. Um, had not been in the building, and the first thing I said to Johnny, um, our Vice President of Marketing and Public Relations for Penrose and South State, I said, we should use this, you know? <laughs> so what do we do when we come into a building? We think of all the times we need a, a setting like this. I'm honored to be a pearl today, so I wore my pearls. How many of you know the origin <laughs> of the word Margaret? It's pearl, right? If you go back, so I'm, I'm I found another Margaret here who was my daughter's English teacher last year. So now, see, when I want to say something important about what the name means, because there aren't many Margarets, um, when I was a, a, a young girl, I'm not sure I liked the name, but I'm, I'm good with it right now. <laughs> now, here's what I'd like to do with you today, and it's going to be um, entirely uh, extemporaneous, as is, my, um, as is my preference. I'd like to talk just for a couple of minutes about, you know, why I personally chose healthcare what sort of things happened when I was younger that made me go into this path. I'd like to talk a little bit about what's going on with healthcare right now, because it's a big deal. We have choices we'll be making and what might it lead to. So those might be some um, facts and information that we could pull back to and questions and answers. I'd like to talk about what we're doing specifically locally, keep those pieces short, and then connect right back to. Um, the, the um, larger reason um, that um, I would like to see changes occur um, in, our, in our country. So let's start locally, Colorado Springs, and how they all tie together. So does that sound fair to you? And within there, if there's some things that are worth something to take away, I will be so honored for having been your, your speaker for the morning. Um, um, I was born Margaret Duggan, um, then baptized Margaret Mary Duggan, and then after catechism I became Margaret Mary Catherine Duggan. Um, I was one of nine, 
and every one of us had all the saints used in our baptism and Catholic name, and a couple of them further on got repeated. I think my parents ran out of, you know, saints' names, so, you know, um, when there was a Brian Francis Duggan for my brother, and then my one sister was Catherine Francis, I said, you used a boy's saint name twice on a boy and a girl, but never mind you. We, we rotated those different um, names in our family, and grew up a very traditional Irish Catholic family which, as you know, um, we have our joys and we have our tragedies. And we certainly, in our family, had our share of tragedies, which I will hook back to. Um, but we had our joys and we had our silliness, and uh, I think we were somewhat a microcosm of, of the American dream with two grandparents so that, um, so I'm second generation Irish, uh, both came over on the boats from New York. Uh, my grandfather, an Irish policeman, um, and came over um, from a very, very difficult depression in, in Ireland um, where, you know, I think sometimes we look at so many things that have happened to our country and what happened in Ireland was as tragic as so many um, other areas. Um, and they were the people on the block, even though they didn't have much of a penny to scrape together, um, they had a little more than some. And we, um, my, my mother recalls going out with lunch baskets to the needy and even to the point when we were, we were younger and both my parents were teachers. I didn't tell you that, Margaret, both my parents were teachers who went on to get their master's degrees in their um, late 40s and early 50s. Um, they, my mom continued the habits of buying dented cans because they were a deal. And I remember the day my dad said, Katie, you're breaking all of our can openers with the dented cans. Perhaps we're not saving money. Nevertheless, she continued buying dented cans. But some of those things we're born with that are culture and how we grow up and what we do. To this day, I can say this, how many of you were part of a military family? A number of us, okay. I'm not sure what your moms and dads were like. My dad was military. To this day, I turn the shower on, and you know what I think? Three minutes, Maggie. He always called me Maggie, three minutes. So to this day, it's a constant irritation between my husband and I, who likes really long showers, and myself, who has the guilt from the childhood of the three-minute shower. So it's funny, these habits we carry forward, and how much do they influence the choices we make everywhere in life? Sometimes it's so subconscious and unconscious, it's hard for us to make the connection afterwards. Um, but we try to do so consciously when it comes to our children, our friends, um, the people that we spend our time with, um, when they run into a quandary and are trying to figure something out. So there, just a little bit of that overall background. Um, getting into healthcare, healthcare was a heck of a lot different 30 years ago um, when I was um, graduating with a master's in health administration and moving into the healthcare field. It was, a, it, it was a time in healthcare, it was somewhat heady, and I say heady because um, we had very large programs that were established, Medicare and Medicaid, to um, take care of those who needed healthcare coverage. And um, while each year, what we talk about now and what has promoted health reform and the Affordable Care Act, not so much issues then of the cost of health care. More the concern was that everybody had access to health care. But yet cost was going up and up and up. And over the years, we started to ask ourselves as a country, hmm, cost is going up. Are we getting healthier as a country? And sadly, our metrics as a country, at least the ones we measure, from the Centers for Disease Control, the American Medical Association, those are the associations that tend to measure things. They measure things, morbidity, mortality, infant mortality, a whole bunch of other things, but let's think about those three. Morbidity is sickness that's unexpected. Mortality is death that's unexpected. And infant mortality is always a very big statistic because it has to do with prenatal health. Um, and, um, and it's a measure every country measures throughout the world. And those measures for us were actually not improving. Even though mortality was extending, morbidity and complications were going up. So we started asking ourselves the question more and more, we're paying more for healthcare, 
And everyone who has it is starting to feel it in their own pocket, because what happened? We started passing on more to consumers, you, in the form of deductibles, co-insurances, et cetera. And that was a way of mitigating the cost increases to other parties. So as we continued and we saw it move from 7% of the gross national product to now almost 16%, many say, unsustainable. That can't continue. We've been saying that, though, for about six years. What made the difference and made the nation push toward the Affordable Care Act at this point? It's slightly opinion, but you'll see it also in much more erudite individuals, editorials, and um, elsewhere. Employers started to say, we've had enough. We can't afford it. I'm spending more on health care than on the raw materials to build a car. So that can't continue. I mean, I can't even sell a product anymore with the cost of health care not being laid on, layered on, and I can't be competitive. Let's take, perhaps, as an example, an employer here in Colorado Springs that, let's say, maybe 20 employees. So that would be a small business. Too small to be what's called self-insured. We as a hospital, and I'll tell you a little more about that later, we're self-insured. We're big enough that we actually can pay our own bills and buy reinsurance for anything catastrophic. And that works okay, because you're large. But generally, any employer under 100, under 75, used to be under 500, but as costs go up and up, people's tolerance for risk goes up and up too, because they say, I can't afford this, I've got to do something different. So back to the small employer, though, 20, they're always going to be fully insured, meaning they're going to have an insurance company that takes care of everything and spreads their risk on what's called community rating. So let's say three of you are part of one employer, everyone else is others. You're going to share in community rating because an insurance company is going to spread it over everybody because they get volume that way. So back to the 20. As the community rating goes up and up, what does the insurer need to do? Raise premiums. And they've been going up, particularly here in Colorado Springs, over the last five years, anywhere from 30 to 70%. Now, let's say this small employer of 20 people, uh, let me think of something I like, coffee, but you wouldn't have 20 people selling coffee. How about wine? How about they sell wine? Okay, everybody mostly enjoys wine. Um, so, so let's say they sell wine, and their average cost for a bottle of wine is $18, because they have expensive wine, they have lower wine, they have that, and their health benefits just went up 50%. Can they layer that on the cost of a bottle of wine, so now you're paying more for a bottle of wine? Probably not. They won't be very competitive, right? So they come to a quandary, and they say, what do I do? Do I drop health insurance completely and just give folks that work for me a little bit more money? Well, let's follow that for a minute. Um, a lot of the employees of very small employers tend to be younger, tend to be healthier. Let's say they're not covered. But on I-25, their car cracks up. And maybe they go through the windshield. And maybe they have a spinal injury. Or maybe a head injury. Let's use a head injury, because that's very common. We see a lot of that in Colorado Springs. They're rushed to the Penrose or the Memorial Emergency Department, either one, both fine organizations. Let's say they come to Penrose, no insurance. We care for that individual the same way we would care for anyone. It ends up being what's called a write-off, but this is an individual who may have a life of health care needs. If they didn't get insurance when it happened, what do you think their chances are of getting insurance afterwards? It becomes a burden to the community, and who pays it? You, 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 you. Because what it does is it goes back and layers in. So I just gave you a very brief, short example of why the number one premise of the Affordable Care Act we need, which is to cover more people. People need to be covered with health care. I mean, if we could all predict the unpredicted, we'd all be playing in the stock market, wouldn't we? But we can't. There's so much we can take care of with our own health. I want to get to that next. But what we can't take care of, we've got to have responsible coverage. I mean, these same individuals, and there are quite a few, usually not by desire, who go without insurance, 
couldn't go without insurance and drive a car, right? So if you couldn't without a car, um, you shouldn't be able to drive in your own body. So Affordable Care Act offering more coverage is a very, very good thing. What we had was broken. It was absolutely broken. The Affordable Care Act goes a long way. It doesn't go all the way. There are unknowns. There are uncertainties. Um, but the, that coverage alone, if it did nothing more, that alone is a good thing. But you know what? It does do some other things. There are incentives now within benefit plans for employers to put in more incentives for health and wellness. So it's up to a certain percentage. It cannot be discriminatory. Everybody has to be able to do it. Um, I think that's a good thing. Let me tell you why. Um, I have a class um, every Saturday, and she told me I could tell you all she was there, because I said, I have a group I'm talking to, and I want to I want to brag about you. And she said, and you go ahead and tell them my age. Lida Hill came and took my boot camp class. I don't know if many of you know Lida. Lida's between 70 and 71, I'm not sure. Um, and she, um, I, you know, she takes very good care of herself. Um, I also have another individual in my boot camp class who was a double lung transplant, is 72. Um, and um, she had the double lung transplant when she was uh, about 45, has some challenges with, that's a very challenging surgery, by the way, a double lung transplant for a lot of people. Um, it doesn't have the best outcome, um, but works very hard to take care of herself. And then I have, you know, some of your um, hard body 40, 50 year olds. Um, so it's a very interesting um, group of people. In that group of people, a young woman stepped up to talk to me. She's from one of the school districts and um, um, had not been participating um, you know, at Penrose St. Francis, but heard about one of our classes through the Old North End. We did a big project with the Old North End neighborhood, and um, that's an interesting story in itself, but it had some pretty incredible outcomes where we worked with a population on health and wellness and balance. And by the way, health and wellness isn't about running a half marathon. It's about eating healthy food. It's about being kind to yourself. It's about getting enough sleep. It's about permission to be joyful. So it's about a lot of other things. I want to be, be clear with that. Anyway, this young woman joined a class that was a, a Weight Watchers, and we subsidized that through the hospital um, and came to some of our other different kinds. We have classes going on all the time. Some people say, is this a hospital? When they walk in the lobby. Um, she lost in six months 68 pounds. So prior to that, I won't give a name, she had been what's called morbidly obese, which means a BMI of over 40. That qualifies by insurance companies for a procedure called bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery, I want to give you a little math here, okay? Bariatric surgery, total cost to the patient, and I'm, I'm you know, because we have this goofy healthcare system where some people pay this, some people pay this, but in general, the package cost of getting a bariatric surgery, which staples down your stomach to a smaller size so you can't eat as much, um, is about $30,000, okay? It can range up to 38,000 to 40,000. If there's complications, it can go higher. So you have an idea now what bariatric surgery costs, right? Okay, this young woman did Weight Watchers classes, so that'd be a cost to us because we support the classes in the facility, um, offer rooms like this for people to come and talk amongst themselves. And then our instructors who teach classes, I believe they're compensated at something like $30 an hour. Um, I teach and just make an extension of being a CEO. I think they go together. You know, I think they fit pretty nicely. Um, that's my Saturday one. And um, she'd lost 68 pounds. And just for a minute, I was struck by the ROI. Hospital lost 30,500. She totally qualified for bariatric surgery because that's the insurance criteria and her business did support it. Versus, I think maybe zero, I'm not sure. So who saved that $30,000? The school district. Now let's talk a minute for the school district. School districts, big ones, tend to be self-insured. A small entity that saves money that is fully insured, it goes back to the insurer and theoretically health premiums are reduced. But the problem is it's not just on what they do because it's spread. 
It's what's called community rating. But school districts and the ones here in Colorado Springs are self-insured. So let's go back to our example of the young lady who would have qualified for $30,000 bariatric surgery, plus probably um, several weeks off work, so you've got to hire a substitute teacher, I forgot about that part, um, and maybe um, a few other things with rehab and follow-up, versus this, this lady who did it on her own. Who saved that $30,000? It was a loss in income to Penrose. Who saved $30,000? The school district. Now, Margaret, this is totally unfair question, but what do you think D11 pays one teacher for a year? Rough. Okay, 45,000. One person not getting a procedure, doing it what our grandmothers would say is the old-fashioned way, saved enough money for them to afford almost one more teacher. There are 9,000 people in D11. What if a few people did that? Aren't we worried about not having enough teachers? Not because there aren't people out there who want to teach, because of our budgets. So I just want you all to be excited about maybe a different way to approach things. We spend way too much money on things we could avoid. We really, really do. And um, as I've been so outspoken about this, our our CEO overall of Centura, I think there was a headline once that says the new CEO of Penrose St. Francis wants empty beds. And he picked up the phone from corporate and, and, call, and this St. Randy Safety, Colorado called me and said, Margaret, you didn't mean to say that. I said, you know what I did? Yes, I'm exaggerating a point. But I want people who don't need to be in the hospital to not be there. I like the ones who come through the front door and take my health classes. I like that. We're always going to have people in for health care. We're always. I can give you all kinds of examples of procedures we do now that are safer than they've ever been. Never has the outlook been so good for a woman with breast cancer. Never. Never. Do you all remember when we'd hear about it 10 years ago and right away we'd have this desolate feeling? But not so much now. It's truly inspiring how much what we're able to do, particularly with early detection. Same way with so many other types of things. And we must be joyful about all of that. We must be. And we must hold our organizations to be the best. They must be good at what they do because you deserve it and because in the end you pay for it. But we must also, we must, must prevent that next child from gaining a disease that used to be thought only, only applicable to adults. We must have the intestinal fortitude as a community to keep that child from getting a disease that is preventable that they will never, ever, ever get rid of. What am I talking about? Diabetes. You bet. I'm talking about diabetes. And I get pretty fired up about this. I have two younger sisters. My youngest sister died two years ago. It was tragic, she shouldn't have died. They both grew up with type one diabetes. So you know the difference, type one is juvenile diabetes. Type two, what was its nickname a long time ago? Thank you, adult diabetes. We don't call it adult diabetes anymore, do we? No, because where is it an epidemic? In children! That's what we can be proud of. I will never sit still. As long as we know there's an epidemic of a totally preventable disease among our children. That is so not okay. It's so not okay. I sat next to a young lady in the juvenile diabetes group because we support some of these entities, particularly now that they're talking more about prevention than treatment. It, it's, by the way, I'm all about treatment. We should do a great job of treatment. But if we're not out front preventing it, it feels as though we're not being truthful to ourselves and to the community. We have to be out front and prevent it. I look at disease like if you imagine in your mind's eye a cliff and there's people falling over the cliff. And I can predict to you, by the way, how many heart attacks there will be next year. Did you know that? 
I'll be, I'll be pretty darn right. I do every year anyway, because I have to budget for the hospital. I can predict to you how many children will get adult diabetes. I can predict to you how many people will get many other diseases that are preventable. I can also predict the unpreventable ones, um, but the preventable ones. And I feel as though sometimes as a group, we sit at the bottom of the cliff and they're falling over. And we said, yep, yeah, I knew. It was about time for that one. About time, here we go. And we have the ambulances waiting at the bottom. And we scoop them up and we do a superb job. In fact, we rank in the top of the nation. Are you aware of that? Penrose St. Francis is the only hospital in the state of Colorado that is among the top 50 in the nation for outcomes. That's pretty heady in your community. But if we work with every one of you, and we work with schools, churches, all of you, employers, and any group that has a passion in their belly to do something about the next generation that'll be better, we could do something that won't cost a lot. We build a little fence at the top of that cliff. And maybe that next person, instead of falling over, maybe it's that young officer who saw too much when they were deployed. And they came back into this community and it's too much. And they have a new young child in the middle of the night. And the next day, they're in jail because they shook the baby and they're in tears. And they say, I don't even remember doing that. We have to prevent that. And that's all, that's all wellness. Wellness is mental health. Wellness is coping, and that doesn't cost a lot. It's time for us as a community to put more dollars into that. And I pledge to you as Penrose St. Francis that that's our passion. Our passion is also what we do to be excellent at when that fence fails and when that fence wouldn't make a difference because there's something there that's genetic and there's something there that we couldn't miss. I pledge to you we'll be the best of the best at that, but we've got to do both and we have to do more of that, of that fence at the top. So back to the Affordable Care Act. When I said the second thing I like about it, the first thing I liked about it was expanding coverage. The second thing I like about it um, is provisions for health and wellness within the employer. Um, it, it sends a message of permission. It sends that message that it is important to take care of yourself and it's important to take care of others and it's important to have that kind of approach as a community that builds um, a culture of health. And if we can get that into everywhere that we socialize, it's why three years ago Penrose St. Francis did the Old North End Project. We called it the Old North End Healthy Neighborhood. And some of you may know it ended up on the front page of USA Today. So I had someone call me from Belgium. <laughs> and I didn't think I knew anyone there. But um, it was a big deal because that community, as a cohort, we did a pre and post testing, um, um, had phenomenal improvements in their health status. One gentleman who had constant, constant chronic back pain um, had a decrease in back pain. Now, we didn't just take subjectively stated um, we did objective measurements, and it was incredible what, what happened in that community. So we want to be out in the neighborhoods. We want to be out with the churches. How many of you have been to a mass in a church where you saw, where you had the um, priest talk a little bit about health and wellness? Okay, good. Because um, I know we've worked with about 10 or 11 churches. And what we've done is go out and talk to all the different priests. Um, and by the way, as a, I grew up very, very Catholic. I think we went to church about three times a week because I went to Catholic grade school, high school, and Catholic college. Um, by the way, Villanova was Augustinian, as you know, and we have bonded too because her son went there. Um, so I went to church a lot, and I decided after a while that Catholics are far too guilty to think they deserve to be healthy. So therefore, <laughs> I thought if we could go out to the, to the churches and say to the priests, this is okay, it's not being narcissistic, we're not worshiping our bodies, maybe we are in a way of how are we going to convey God's message if we're not in a healthy status to do it. So finally the priest says, well, we'll look about it. And so we went into the church with those, you know, those little clicky things. What are they called, Johnny? Gizmos? 
gizmos, and we got in the different churches, the priests to ask people what came, what came up, kept, kept them up at night, what they worry about. The priest afterwards, the next day, when we looked at the results, because it's anonymous, and people tend to be more honest anonymously. I mean, good Lord, look at our children on Facebook. I mean, I try to say that's not anonymous, but anyway. Um, and you know what people are worried about? Health. Health of someone they love. How they could afford health into the future. That came out as top. So the priest who didn't think it was part of it said, you know what? So I, I believe in that. So we wrote up some materials for incorporating messages, and in some of the church bulletins, next time you go, if you notice, you'll see we've got some health messages and health tips. Um, so neighborhoods, schools, really it's going to be where we live, where we love, where we learn, where we pray, where we play. Well, that's where we're going to make a difference with health out in the neighborhoods. You'll notice you probably saw a, um, um, an announcement about a um, um, uh, partnership uh, with YMCA at Monument. And so Penrose St. Francis will be partnering there. And um, it, it just made sense as a collaboration. But also, I want to be where there's, where there's some more children to influence the future. And I want to use the wisdom that all of us have together to try to influence the world to be a better place. I mean, think of something that we have. And I'll just speak now to um, everyone over the age of 50, which Johnny's not yet. So we'll just speak to the over, uh, over 50 group. Um, we have something that that group doesn't have. We have the power of hindsight. Oh my goodness. We have the ability to have lived through something, gone past it, and look back on it. The youth, real youth, don't have that. All they have is this huge, huge front mirror, right? Which is important. Everything's ahead of them. Sometimes they're not sure what risks lie there and what dark spots are there. And how could we collaborate more as generations in not so much warning about the risks, because to risk nothing is to gain nothing, we know that, but to, to look and impart some wisdom where it makes sense. I'd like to see our generations not be so siloed, but come together. A beautiful way to come together is to build that sustainable future. And so any opportunity we can have to work on that more, I appeal to you on and I look forward to. Um, we are um, looking at working with Colorado College. I think you know about D11, I already mentioned that, the churches, Colorado College, neighborhoods. Um, what am I missing here? We've got some other interesting conversations going on elsewhere in the community that I'm very excited about it, so we're trying to hit all sectors. Um, but if we can pull together our collective strength and our wisdom, we have a chance to change a few trends that are happening now that we cannot be proud of. I'm not going to go to my grave and own that this is when um, our children no longer had the chance to live as long of us as us. I'm not, go I'm not going with that. Uh-uh. Not doing it. <laughs> not. So um, what, what we need to do is build that opposite path. By the way, just because I don't want to leave it out, we also need to do it in terms of sustainabil sustainability and how we treat our earth. And I just go to science to look at this one. My husband does happen to have a PhD from the Colorado School of Mines um, and is um, um, just by nature uh, tends to be a little bit more conservative. Um, but if we were more conservative as a country, I'm not sure we'd have some of the myriad of issues we have. But think about some of the things we just talked about in terms of health care, taking care of ourselves, demanding the best of the best when, again, the, the safety net is not there, when we have that unexpected heart attack, expecting the best, expecting that we are in an organization that performs at the top of the nation. There's no reason that should not happen. Um, but as we, as we look at what we, what we can do, um, the opportunities um, are absolutely uh, myriad in scope. Um, and that would be a proud thing to, to usher in. So I want to talk a little bit about when I, when I mentioned you demanding and accepting the best of the best, let's pick an example, just one example. I won't go through them all. Let's pick um, cardiac programs. Cardiac programs, a cardiac event is a life-ending event. It's, it's, it's an event that can occur and um, 
have um, obviously fatal tragic outcomes. And um, it's, it's um, so let me ask you, across the country per thousand, is heart surgery increasing or decreasing? Now don't think, don't think the non-invasive part. Think actual heart surgery. You're correct that it's increasing in numbers, but it's decreasing in percentage. And the reason why is drug-eluting stents and all the things that can be done non-invasively. So non-invasive is a very, very important approach. But there's still, and we're seeing younger and younger people with massive heart attacks. And sometimes you say, how would we ever have even begun to predict that? What might we have known that could have been a risk factor? Now, in fact, there are risk factors, but they're also silent. And you don't feel a risk factor. Did you ever wake up and th say, my cholesterol feels good today? <laughs> Yet what a predictor, right? What a predictor. So a little side note, know your numbers, know your numbers. But in terms of that, what's impingent upon tertiary centers of excellence is to not have programs where they're doing under 100 heart surgeries a year. Some states have certificate of need which regulates. We don't have it here. I think it's okay we don't have it. The theory being that um, just the desire to do extremely well and be competitive will differentiate. Um, but we looked hard, uh, the team and myself, when I came to Penrose five years ago and said, we're doing about 190 heart surgeries a year. That's okay. That's not world class. This community deserves world class. We're on a run rate to probably do 500 this year. Now, now, is it because 200 more people had heart disease in Colorado Springs? No. A large chunk of the, particularly valves, I have to clarify, because Johnny and I were having a discussion the other day, particularly valves comes from outside Colorado Springs. Two short stories. One, I do have a favorite shopping place in Cherry Creek called Neiman Marcus. My husband calls it needless markup. But they have really good sales, I just want to say. And I, I was there, this was a couple months ago, and um, one of the, uh, um, I, I was looking for someone I knew there, couldn't find them, and the lady who, who runs the um, designer department said, oh, Margaret, can I help you? It's bad she knew my first name. But anyway, um, she said, oh, my friend's husband just had heart surgery at Penrose. I said, oh, do they live in Colorado Springs? She said, no, they live in Cherry Creek. And I said, oh, um, well, do they have friends who live in Colorado Springs? Because uh, you know lately, driving up I-25 has been this way all summer is no fun, right? Um, and, and she said, no, no, we Googled it, and it said that that was the place to go for this particular surgery. And in fact, that was true. Um, a couple days later, bump into um, a young man at the coffee bar. I'm always very friendly at the coffee bar, right? Um, because someone may offer to buy me a cup of coffee. Not really, but I, as Johnny knows, I'll buy them a cup of coffee. And um, there's a gentleman there um, from, now this just happened last week, from uh, uh, San Antonio. So I'm always kind of interested, San Antonio, all the way here. I know we do have a big Texas connection, but, uh, uh, he, and he said we were in um, Pagosa Springs and his wife suffered a heart attack. And so um, um, they were here for that reason. So sometimes it's travel. We do have a lot of that during the summer. But it's also transparency of information. Now more and more information is available to you. Let's say you had a friend or you had something and it wasn't the unexpected. Because in that case, it's the flight for life um, and, um, or it's an ambulance and you're, you may not have as much choice, right? Because we very carefully dictate in tr situations of trauma where people go to what level. It's a community guidelines to make sure that you are well taken care of. But let's say you're making a choice, all right? I'll use myself. I had to have hernia surgery um, a few months ago. I'd put it off for eight years. I lifted something really heavy and I remember I felt a little twinge and then two weeks later there's a lump and I said, I have a tumor. <laughs> the doctor laughed, you don't have a tumor, you have a hernia. But, but has, has anyone here ever had a hernia? You know how you wake up in the morning and it's gone? but at night it's back because the fluids kind of settle into that weakening of the stomach muscle. So they come and they go and you ignore them for a really long time until they can become what's called incarcerated. Do not, you all be careful, do not let that 
happen, I was just pre that, but once it's incarcerated and the muscle encloses around it, that's a very, very, very bad thing. That could be life-threatening because you have a part of your body that's cut off and, and stuck. Um, and by the way, a lot of women get very small hernias right under your belly button and you think it's just an Audi. Well, that little cute Audi might actually be a little hernia. And even though they're tiny, they can be dangerous. So if you find an odd spot there, um, and for men, it's usually more an inguinal region hernia and, as opposed to umbilical. But keep an eye on it, get it fixed. It's a very, very minor surgery. But I had to have that. And still I worried because, you know, things happen, right? And I want to know about infections. I want everyone washing their hands before they're, you know, into my business. Um, and I want to know <laughs> that there's appropriate decorum. And, and I mean, I'd put it off right here, as you can tell, I was not looking forward to this. But you can go on a very easy um, website and you can look at outcomes by hospitals and by doctors. And um, it just pops right up, it's easy to do. I don't even know how to use Facebook, by the way, but I do know how to Google the name of some of these companies. So have any of you ever done that? You haven't, you have, okay. And, oh, but you can. Um, and so um, there are a number of different sites. Which one's the top one in the in United States um, for looking up data? Johnny, do you know? Uh, WebMD. WebMD, but the top consumer traffic? That's health grades. So you just type healthgrades.com, and if you go in, like even if you just wondered about, um, oh gosh, I mean, almost pick any condition. It's a wealth of information. And even though I, I know it, it's my business, I never personally um, used it. And, and you can look at complications, you can look at what other people say, and, and what the ratings are, and you can just get it as a summary. Do patients rate this doctor on his bedside manner? Usually there's a picture of the doctor, which is nice, you know, it's nice to sort of have a sense of who you're gonna see. I always tell all of them, please do not use your high school picture. They all know you are way out of high school, okay? I want a current picture and a current philosophy. So um, some doctors even will embed a little video of perhaps their approach, you know, when they're doing that particular procedure. So anyway, back to hearts, we're now doing we're, we're, we're doing, um, it's right around 400, but we have several hospitals that are outside of um, um, Colorado Springs, one in um, Garden City, Kansas, one in uh, Durango, that have made a decision to affiliate with our cardiac program, which means that those individuals who need it, they will transport to Penrose St. Francis, which is good for our com uh, economy. You know, they'll be here and families will be here. Um, and so we've upped that volume. Okay, what does that mean? It means the last two surgeons we attracted, we were able to go to places that we probably wouldn't have been able to four years ago, because I don't think they'd have been interested in us. Um, and you know what, I think it's really cool, they're both women, but not that I think we need all women, now we have two men, two women in our cardiothoracic program. Um, Dr. John Mihal's our rock star, but we, um, the one woman is from Mayo Clinic, pretty good, right? She'd worked there for 10 years. Um, she's absolutely incredible. And the other woman is from Cleveland Clinic, and she'd been there for about a long period of time. Now, I don't know where you go to get better. And they came to Colorado Springs. They came to Colorado Springs. So we need the best, of, I know I talked a lot about wellness and prevention. And uh, um, let me tell you why I talked about wellness and prevention. Um, in the last six years, um, my youngest brother, we call him my baby brother, Brian. Um, my baby sister, Joan. And my next brother, Brian, we always called him the three little ones because there were four of us and then a gap. And then the three little ones. And we always called him my two older brothers and myself and my sister. We called him the three little ones because, you know, we were grown up enough to sort of think, really, is this not enough? Do we need these? But, you know, we loved them. We changed our diapers and anything. Last six years, all quite a bit younger than me, they all died. And they didn't need to die. They didn't need to die. Um, you know, the baby, Brian, by the way, six foot three, size 15 shoes, walked into a hospital in Maryland. He was carried out. He walked in. Um, I won't go into all the details, but I will tell you it was an emotional moment at the Medical Executive Committee at Penrose when my first Med Exec Committee, 
I just, you know, my brother Brian and, and everything else that occurred around that, they had a discussion of what the mistake was at the hospital that caused his death. He was a big boy. He was big in a lot of ways. Had, you know, a bit of a tummy, but he, I mean, he, he walked miles a day, did everything. They over-sedated him. He had sleep apnea, and his body couldn't take it, and he died of a massive heart attack. He was in his 40s, early 40s, died. And so that first night at MEC, they were passing a sleep apnea protocol. And I had to leave, and someone said, what's wrong? And I, I, well, I'm, I, this is, these are things I haven't always been comfortable sharing, so I never shared it. But that night, to talk about what was the cause of death, that other hospital hadn't done what they should have done, and just lots of morphine. Big, big boy, but not with sleep apnea. You can't do that. It's a never event. You never, ever do that. So I want, I want us to know that those national criteria that are already set, we don't think we're better to fly above them, that we're going to apply them religiously. And if we don't, we're going to discipline those who don't, that there won't be a spot for them at Penrose St. Francis. We're going to have a culture of quality, but we're going to have a culture of safety. First, do no harm. First, do no harm. Because if we don't adopt that, it doesn't matter how good you are, you cannot have that risk in your organization. So thus, my personal passion for what we can do, health, wellness, and prevention, my desire um, to carry that forward. Also, the belief that organizations have to strive to be better because not only is the community demanding it, but we can't afford a path of not doing uh, well with what we do. So um, with all that, I'm, I'm, I'm easing to wrapping up and asking you as the individuals that I think hold the most wisdom in our community, look at all the different sectors you represent here. What if you took that collective wisdom, and you, it sounds like you're kind of doing it in this series. I mean, you're bringing, in, you're bringing in teachers, you're bringing in people from education, you're bringing in for people from healthcare. I kind of love it. <laughs> what if you spoke with a collective voice? And I wouldn't mind, for example, don't tell Danny, my CFO, this, but I wouldn't mind if, you know, you uh, had an outcome of this where, you know, on your letterhead, and Ross, I suppose I'd get it from you, you said, dear Ms. Sabin, you know, as a community, we'd like to see Colorado Springs be the healthiest community in the world, and we'd like to be the place where um, younger brothers don't go to die. You know, we'd like to know that we are the best of the best, and we'd like you to focus on boom. I don't know for 100% we can do it, but I'm telling you, I'd like to be open to that. Maybe it would be a school in your community. We are doing a lot with D11 right now. Now it's a little bit more focused with the teachers because what we're hoping is those teachers will be like Margaret and will exude a, a belief and a passion for, for health and wellness that will translate to role models for children. Because think of who was role models for all of us when we were younger. Take a minute and go back memory lane. Think of someone who touched um, not just your mind, but they touched your heart. They touched your soul. They made something in you shine, and they made something in you want to either be that or emulate to that or aspire something they said. Those are the things that, that pull us and drive us in life. Think of who that was. How can we be that in our community, in our different venues of where people are? Because we all know that for change to occur, we have to connect with your why, not your what. We get a lot of what. We get pinged all the time with the what. The what is, you know, the schedule today, the fix the car, the go get your, what's that procedure? Um, where you make sure you don't have colon cancer, colonoscopy. You know, we, all that is sort of the what. The why. The why is so we can live. The why is so we can inspire others. The why is that piece of us that is immortal, that connects to the generations and the futures to come. And our ability to touch that is a why that transcends anything.
Yes, the what's important, it's how we get there. It's those discussions we have with other community leaders to take something you're doing and make it something that will deliver into the future and generations to come. That's a piece of immortality. That's a piece of taking our wisdom and making it impact the future. Isn't that what we all want to do, right? And if that's what we can be involved in, and I honestly think your series is, 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 is a piece of that, that's so inspiring. It's so exhilarating. Um, it, it's such a greater than ourselves wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Now let me end with what a school teacher said, because aren't I really supposed to be done now, Johnny? It's 5 of 11. Okay. Let me end with what I read from a school teacher's book, and I'm dedicating this one to Margaret. She's probably already heard it. But it was about when the teacher ended her, her first class with first graders, and she wanted them to be excited and inspired. And she said, I want you all to take out a pencil and a piece of paper, and I want you to draw something that you know, you're excited about. And she goes around the room. You know, Everybody's drawing, stops here, stops at that young man over there. What's your first name? Henry. Henry? She stops at Henry says, Henry, what are you drawing? And Henry said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, well, we've never seen God. We don't know what he looks like. And Henry said, well, you will when I'm done. <laughs> so we may be uncertain about the future. There are pieces of the Affordable Care Act that are uncertain. But with our will, our precious, precious amount of hindsight, which is wisdom, hindsight is wisdom used appropriately, and our ability to influence leaders in this community, Mayor Bach, Jill Teethenthal, Margaret Sabin, Johnny Ray, you are our community. It's why we're here. You tell us what you'd like us to focus on more. Granted, we're going to have things that we do, but if we're not responding to your needs and your vision of the future, then we're not really being leaders, because our real job is to build the future. We have teams who run the present. Help us be the kind of leaders that you want and you aspire to, and it would be an honor. Thank you. Yep.